Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind, brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, and it is lovely to be back in my seat. Um, folks, we have a great show for you, but of course, if you are familiar with Cannabis Lab, we are having so many amazing events that you need to keep up with. As I've mentioned before, we have expanded our in-person events to both the Tampa and Orlando markets. Of course, we will still do be doing events in the Tri-County area in South Florida. So if you are in the Florida cannabis community, you are a grower, you are a bud tender, you are an executive, you support the industry, you're a fan, you're a client, you are a lawyer, you're an accountant, whoever you are, and you are a fan of cannabis and you want to get together with us, you can check us out at American Social on the, I believe, the third and fourth Thursdays, depending on what market you're in every month. You can check us out at our coffee meetups in the morning. Those are on the third and fourth Tuesdays every month. Of course, every month we also have our national uh, virtual programming. So for anybody who is anywhere in the world, we do amazing panels once a month at 4.20 p.m. on the third Thursday of every month. Of course, you can find all this on our Eventbrite site. The easiest way to find it is just to go Google Eventbrite Cannabis Lab. Of course, if you want another link, you can check out joincelab.com. And if you want to check out any more of these podcasts, you can go to www.youtube.com slash Cannabis Lab. Find us on all social media at The Cannabis Lab. And that should be all the plugs that we have for today. So let's get into the conversation, folks. Um, you know, there is this, this industry is very interesting. And, and selfishly, I tend to talk about a specific subset of the market because it's the specific subset of the market that I've worked in that I've had experience in. But I truly think that some of the better episodes of this um, are not where I share my expertise because obviously you guys know I tend to take over the conversation, but where we bring in someone who knows a lot more um, than I pretend to know about. And that market happens to be outside of this country and outside of the realm of where I work. I think and I hope that there is a revolution in plant medicine and we're at a point in time where these things are coming to fruition, right? We've we've done the pharmaceutical thing for a very, very long time. And I think cannabis is leading that charge and psychedelics is coming quickly behind it. The beauty about the psychedelic industry is not everything is schedule one. So there is actual medical uses and trials that can be done with a lot of the psychedelics. I actually get jealous somewhat um, of the psychedelic community because of the capital they can raise because they're doing it in a very clinical setting that's familiar to people. Whereas cannabis, it's the recreational side of it. It tends to get the attention, not the, the medicinal side of it. So with that being said, a good friend of our show, Cynthia brought us an expert from Latin America who's doing, who has done amazing things in cannabis and is continuing his journey with the plant medicine revolution into the world of psychedelics. So without any further further ado, please welcome Marco Algorta, the current CEO of Bienstar and the president of the National Chamber of Companies in Cannabis for Uruguay. Who better to tell us about Latin America? Marco, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Todd. Thank you very much. I'm very, really honored to be here. Really, for me, is a well, the enormous honor. Well, once you find out, it's pretty much my parents and like three friends that watch this show. The honor is going to dwindle quickly. But where where are you joining us from today, Mark? Are you in Brazil right now or what country are you in? No, right now I'm in Uruguay. I'm in a small city uh, between Uruguay and Argentina in just in the border. It's called Paysandu. This is where I live with my kids. I have five kids. I have a big family. So uh, I need to have a very good country space, let's say like that. So I'm here in this beautiful scenario where I live. But I'm always traveling to Brazil where I work. That's Very that. cool, man. Um, I mean, you know, obviously I, I consider myself an expert and I'm probably the only one in, in the cannabis industry here in the United States. And it's very broken because we have 50 states in this country and everybody kind of has their own regulations around cannabis. It's very disjointed. You know, I, I tend not to look at other countries and what they're doing or even the public opinion of it. I know that or the reputation of this country is that of a prude when it comes to things that Latin America and even Europe um, find regular in life. And it's interesting when you look at it, this country, what is the reception for plant medicine and more specifically cannabis at first down in Latin America? I, as you know, my only experience is going to um, conventions in Mexico. And as I understand in Mexico, it is it's very taboo, even though back in the day it was used in, in home remedies very much. And, you know, two generations removed from the entrepreneurs of today, um, they use it in home remedies. But as I understand it, many young Mexicans 
uh, have trouble talking to their family or getting buy-in from their family with these deep religious backgrounds. What about further down South in Latin America, in South America, what is the court of you know public opinion think of the cannabis plant currently what's the state of the the industry down there let's uh, let's remember that the drug and wars have this great victim or the biggest victim is south america and latin america right? uh, we produce um, most of the drugs that the world use and cocaine and and even cannabis and uh, illegal cannabis in the world so we have a lot of problems with drugs we have always social problems with drugs we have generations and generations, that's happened to in the US, from young people and poor people who are in jail for drugs. So, of course, drugs have a big, big, big stigma here. And we are in a religion, in a region very Catholic, very Catholic region, very conservative in some way. So it's not easy to talk about drugs in this area of the world. But at the same time, you have a, a, a culture, a, a traditional culture, he's very Approach, approach with the drugs. Now here, look, I'm, I'm taking amate. Amate is, is, is a drink, a beverage that you take in Argentina and, and Uruguay that came from the indigenous people. Most of those plants, that's many some plants, come from an indigenous tradition. So in the same time that you have a big war of drugs that working to the stigma, you have a, a traditional use of those plants who make the balance. And of course, that we have a enormous tradition of cycles and cycles plant, uh, making cannabis and making uh, cocaine and making ayahuasca and other drugs. So it's, it's difficult for one side, but you have a good option because you have a, a, a very traditional and old culture that helps you to talk about. And when you, you reach this, this, uh, this point in conversations, when you reach that we... Latin America, we have the, the historical obligation, let's say like that, to be a leader in this field because you have a knowledge that nobody has, then people start to change. And really, you need to work on that. Then, of course, education is the most important part of all this industry, say psychedelics, say cannabis, is education, 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 because we live in a world that doesn't understand really what drugs are here he are really and you are always looking drugs like a problem and not a, like a solution and that's what we need to explain to this region and to the world yeah and i noticed you know on your linkedin that you have you know experience in pr and and, and have worked in that space it's almost as if some of these drugs got lumped into this terrible PR campaign because drugs like cannabis and psychedelics eventually got lumped in with cocaine and you know other things and and some of the harmful stuff and eventually led to fentanyl that it is of this overall conversation on quote unquote drugs and then yes it does look down upon that a lot of that comes from latin america and hollywood has done a great job of glamorizing that and you know putting the blame on that but in the reality of the situation you know as you mentioned there was a relationship with these plants that were led to create these drugs like i i Seven years ago at this point, geez, it seems like yesterday, I remember being down in Peru. And one of the first things that happens when you go into a nice hotel in Peru is they make you a coca tea from, you know, the coca leaves, or they tell you to chew them if you're up in the mountains. And if you happen to, you know, go on a tour, if you meet someone who works, you know, on the farms up there, they're chewing on them all day for energy. And it's just a different natural really it's a relationship with the natural version of the plant, not the one that's been, you know, processed in some facility. So it's it's interesting and I'd love to understand kind of I imagine I think you just said this there's two camps where it's you have that long standing tradition with the plants that these drugs were created from that just comes from being indigenous to the land you know those tribal backgrounds um having a farming background in that particular area where these particular plants grew very very well versus the other camp that gone up through, call it the narco side of things, where it was just purely for profit and they didn't care what went into it or what happened. It was, how do we make it cheaper? How do we distribute it more? Do you really see those two camps where you have that like more natural, traditional, religious, spiritual relationship with these plants and products versus you know the people who just see it as kind of the narco path? Yes, you have this. That's very, uh, very clear here in South America, this two sides of of, of the, the, the the drugs problem let's say like that or the drugs drugs issue let's say like that. 
So yes, but what I what I see that with a truly education, trying to really show all the problems that drugs, uh, drugs point of view, uh, drugs prohibition of drugs uh, are making, all those problems that are making uh, um, in Latin America. And if you see, and you start to show the opportunity, you know, let's just say about the drug problem, let's say about the opportunity of the, of the drug. And you start to show the, the opportunity on drugs, the opportunity that you have with the cannabis industry or the psychedelics industry and what can, what that can be representative to our countries, people really start to change. I, I start to really see a change um, in, in, in South America. In the beginning, it was like, okay, that's, that's now like uh, something that's happened in the US and Canada. And no, okay, that's gringo things. I say like that. But people you now start to see that things are changing. Today, in, in, the, in, the, in the main newspaper of, of Uruguay, in the in the in the big port in the in the in the big photo, uh, you have flowers of cannabis today. In flowers of cannabis because because Uruguay has export eight hundred kilos to U.S. of hemp flowers. Mm. So that's something that seven years ago it was impossible. You never yeah. were gonna think how we're gonna be there in the, the front page of a newspaper of the the main newspaper of Uruguay. And now it's natural. Now is the news. Okay, Uruguay have opened the U.S. market for hemp flowers. So we start to see that people start to talk about cannabis, let's say the example, not like a drug, but like a new product that Uruguay can sell to the world. Yeah. See, that's incredible to me. And that's one of the things, you know, I talk about on the show and it just kind of the background here is you, we look at federal legalization just in the United States. And my thought has always been that you're going to have the majority of cannabis coming from California with craft growers popping up around the country, specifically probably indoor groves or people that are on similar longitude and latitude, the same way that you see wine, right? Most of it comes from California to simming, but you have, once we get not just interstate commerce, but you know, international commerce throughout the world, which I don't know how, far we are from that and probably much much further than these nations individually you know nationalizing it themselves but it'll be interesting to see where the country of origin of a lot of the products that you are going to have on shelves in the cannabis world are going to be because you do have this deep history of latin america of farming and cultivating cannabis especially if i imagine correctly sun-grown cannabis within the mountains and everything else that there's a different type of quality that we may not see here and i see the true competitors to the california market being the places in the rest of the world with latin america being one of those big solid hubs of cannabis going to the rest of the world now like you just said you are able to export hemp flour right now and we're not at a point where we're seeing you know, where I can go to a dispensary, I can only see it from whatever the local state is, but it's going to be amazing at some point when some of these families that traditionally have been growing it for so long and generations, and it's just what they know, are able to actually build a legitimate family business the same way they could in coffee or tobacco or anything else, um, opening that up. Is that something that, you know, that Latin America truly looks forward for? Is there any of their lobbying efforts around that to the national or to the international community? Yes, I have been working in this lobby a long, for a long time when I was a, I was a president of the chamber in Uruguay. Uh, so, yes, we see that, but it's not easy because we still be in a very high regulated industry. So export is much more difficult than you can show in a PPT or in an Excel projection. You know? uh, export is really difficult because about quality, about price, price are changing all the time. It's very difficult, the logistic point, you know, how I will take this product to US and authorizations, uh, some time authorizations because you don't have a direct flight. So you need to, your flight needs to stop in a country that is legal to the cannabis. So how can I take to another point? It, you have a lot of complications that other, other industries don't have. But of course, they do have that. We have a good soil, a good cli clima. We have experience. And if you think in a sustainable world, you don't have a carbon food fit so strong that you can have in Canada or in other uh, states of US. So that's something. You have a, a most ecologic uh, system of growth 
than than other regions in the world. So that will help us a lot too, you know, because this not, it's not greenwashing. We are talking now. Let's say well, let's talk about a really sustainable cannabis production to people. Oh, yeah, because of course you see the the the, the facilities in, in Canada spending I don't know a lot a lot of kilowatts and energy and okay what's that that's not a, a green cannabis no it's no. a very so and that's why one of the reasons I think that Latin America when this uh, industry will be less regulated will be the leader in production of cannabis in the world. Agreed. And, you know, it, listen, I, I love indoor weed as much as the next guy, but you look at these facilities in Canada and the United States, and they are much more factories than they are farms right now. You know, they're indoor. There's a lot of metal pieces. There is a ton of wastewater. There are harmful chemicals. I mean, things just is this is this is a company that I really just I, I just started with a couple of friends of mine, but just things as far as bringing more natural disinfectants to the industry, right? Like the the products like Xeritol and Sanidate that people are using, it, it burns pre- people's hands, it can harm the plants, it can be super corrosive and just things of that nature. It is very much like a factory and it's a very clean and sterile environment for the best, but they're not using natural things to do that. And all that builds up within the product itself. I love, you know, sun grown weed gets a lot of hate, especially here in the United States, because there are only so many people, so many places where you can actually do it. Well, your Humboldt County in California being one of them, like not really going to have great sun, sun grown weed down here in Florida. The humidity is just ridiculous and you're going to have issues with that. So to have more regions that have the, and I hate saying this word because I butcher it every time the terrar that has the ability to grow sun grown cannabis and grow it naturally. I think that is really a really good asset that the industry will have going forward that you're going to have these pockets where you can do it sustainably and you can do it naturally and it goes back to the root of the plants and people won't need a hundred million dollars in startup capital to buy a five hundred thousand square foot facility and put how many thousand you know how many hundreds of lights in there and metal trays and everything else so i'm excited at you know the future i do think it's very very far off what is, and, and I'm sorry if you went into this already, what is the market in Latin America? Are there countries that have it, quote, recreational or adult loose like we do, or is it mostly, you know, a heavily regulated medical market? No, we have just Uruguay, who have a very open market. Uh, you know, we have now Puerto Rico that, that have some medical flowers market. Uh, Panama maybe will change. But after that, what you have is oil-based products. Uh, in Argentina, in Paraguay, in Brazil, in Colombia, uh, but not flour directly. You no, know? it does oil-based product, but yes, still be a region that's still be very slow. It's not a big, big market, but it's really growing fast. You no, know? Brazil, the the sale of cannabis in Brazil have grown in the last five years 125 percent per year, and if you think that that's a potential market of two hundred million persons. Okay, it's like eight, uh, seven times Canada, uh, six times Canada, seven times Canada. And we're talking about, I don't know, Argentina, we're talking about Colombia. So that you have a lot of persons that really can enjoy and use cannabis in the future. But of course, the, the, the really question is not if you're going to have or it's not going to happen. The question is when, where, when and how, no? And, and that's always a question that's in, in the air because okay, people raise some money to make the business. After that, um, the, the changes in regulation uh, go much more slowly than, than we're expecting to be. So it start to be a, a little difficult to really uh, maintain your cash burn uh, and the sales start to grow. Now it's always this balance is very difficult in America because you're dependent too much uh, about regulations. The same of Canada and US, but you don't we don't have a so open market how you have in, in Canada and US. Yeah. You know, people don't realize population is, is something that is very important. You know, I remember when we were building a brand, one of our partners said, Well, why don't we look at Canada? It's legal nationally there. I'm like, Yeah, but they only have twenty eight million people. There's thirty eight million people in the state of California alone. I go I go just from a logistical standpoint, the amount of people we need to cover the the country of you know, can the country of Canada, which obviously Latin America is a lot more concentrated is where the population is, but just the amount of people alone, we would need to represent the brand for the amount of people that live there. It just wasn't 
worth it when we can focus that effort in California or Arizona or somewhere with a higher concentration. So I totally get if you have to face the same regulations, the same tax issues and everything else that we have to face here with a smaller market and probably just as many people that want to get into that market because they might have a history of a much larger market and call it legacy. It is very interesting. Um, have you guys seen any, you know, I know that you've, you've been involved on the lobbying side as well as being an advocate for the plant and everything else. And there are, you know, so many reasons around that it is an, it is a phenomenal tool from a medicinal or even a wellness standpoint. I know that you've gone further into the world of psychedelics, but looking at cannabis right now, is there any kind of correlation um, in Latin America right now where you see, as we do here in the United States, where a legalization of cannabis will actually lower um, alcohol and opiate use wherever it's legalized? Are you guys seeing anything to that tune in Latin America? Uh, that, that's, a, uh, that's a good question because in Uruguay, um, I don't know, two two months ago, the the national board drug, like say like that, they have um, um publicate um uh, investigation have made with young people, adolescents, and it showed that young people smoke less than the, the young people uh, before the legalization, and not just that, like that, they 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 drink a little less alcohol than other generations. They still use uh, energized uh, drinks more. That's some difficult. Uh, Non-prescribed drugs sell in pharmacy. They use it more. That's a problem. That's the biggest problem in the drug world, let's say like that. But they use it much more non-prescribed drugs. But they're using less alcohol. And even they're using less cannabis, you know, with more controlled cannabis, let's say like that. So... You, you see that really regulation and, and uh, true legalization of cannabis make uh, a better health space in young people. Okay? And that's something that Uruguay have really told to the world, even with the national, the OMS, the our, uh, National Organization of Health, the International Organization of Health, say something different. Always they make different um, uh, lectures uh, about what's happening in Uruguay. But really what you see in Uruguay is a better, on the, better information of to young people so they can take better decisions. And that's more important. No? Legalization brings always good information. Very cool. How, uh, so what brought you over from the cannabis world into the world of psychedelics? And I kind of have an idea, but you know, I really like what you're doing with the end star. And I understand that there is, there's a component around treating different ailments. One of those being addiction, right? So tell us how, how your plant medicine journey brought you from the world of cannabis into psychedelics and what you're seeing as far as psychedelics in South America, because we're starting to see it here. And you know, my wife and I have gone back and forth many, many times. Anybody who listens to this show knows that she was an addiction counselor before we had kids. And we talk about, you know, she would talk about marijuana maintenance with, with addicts here and how they didn't really consider it a drug like the rest of them. But she wasn't entirely sure that, you know, marijuana was a substitute addiction for everything else that we were doing. So she wasn't big on that. But when it came to psychedelics and, you know, I, I'm a big fan of comedy and a lot of comedians are super messed up in the head you know there was one in particular gary goldman that was talking about doing ketamine therapy here in the states and how it helped them and then she started looking into that and it was funny she was a lot more open to psychedelic therapy than she was anything that had to do with cannabis so this is a debate that we've had i'd be curious to understand you know how you went from one to the other and what you're seeing in the advantages tell us some of the work that you're doing in psychedelics yeah well uh, the the world of psychedelics shows you so someone who's working with cannabis when when it starts to talk, talk about schedule one and all those lists you start to read all those lists that's schedule one let's say like substance and you see a lot of substance a lot of things and you start to to think how you can manage all the substance because like you say some substance for us are in schedule one for other countries are in schedule six that's the case of ibogaine we're going to talk about later so you start to see that you have main possibilities and cannabis is one in 100. Uh -huh. We always talk about cannabis, cannabis, cannabis. Okay, yes, that's true. Cannabis is very socialized. A lot of people use it, but you have a universe of possibilities with another substance, control substance. And even the most of this control substance that came for a plant world. So uh, plant-based uh, substance. 
So that's uh, when I start to compare the regulation in the U.S., what happened in the U.S., maybe even in Canada and in Vancouver, and start to think what happened in Mexico, I start to see all the possibilities that Brazil brings to us. Because when you talk about Brazil, cannabis in Brazil, okay, it was like well, when you arrived to Brazil, talking about cannabis, it was like the desert, no? It was so, so difficult to start to sell the first bottle, say, oh, because... In Brazil, cannabis is schedule one, two, so it was very similar the system, so it was very difficult. But we start to see about psychedelics. Let's talk about something very important. One of the most important psychedelics, DMT, ayahuasca, came from Brazil, mm-hmm. the region. No? After that, Brazil is the third country in the world who have more scientific publications about psychedelics. So we are when you talk about Brazil in psychedelics, you're talking one. One, one of the most prepared country to receive this kind of revolution in mental health. So we start with see the, the, all those opportunities and we start to see about Ibogaine. Now, Ibogaine in Brazil is schedule six. So it's possible to, to, to treat people with Ibogaine. And I found a doctor who's working with Ibogaine for the last 27 years. No, I remember when he told me that the first time he, he, he's listening about psychedelics, Renaissance, he say, oh, what's psychedelics Renaissance? Oh, I have been done that for the two, last 20 years. <laughs> I didn't know this name. I never heard psychedelic Renaissance. So uh, that's how I, I really see an opportunity. I thought, of course, we are talking about a market of 200 million persons. We, we, we don't have we are the only company talking about psychedelics because the rest of them that was doing ketamine have very they are afraid about stigma so really talking about psychedelics because we believe in true information and we, and we work a lot with people with addiction you know and, and uh, drug abuse addiction cocaine people who came from us and canada but they have opioid addiction um people came in from um, Europe. And uh, next week I'm going to Sao Paulo because we're going to receive patients from Kuwait. You know? uh, so people from all around the world came into Brazil to talk about uh, treating addiction. Why? Because Ibogaine works very well with addiction. We have in, in our database more than 2,000 patients. And for those 2,000 patients, we have more than 78, 78% of persons who one year after the treatment is still free of the, the addiction no? is a, is a very impressive name if, if you compare with another type, kind of treatments. So really works. If you if you really put a protocol to prepare integrate uh, preparation of the patient, the the experience uh, with a good protocol to really don't have any problems during the the trip, and the integration of this trip to their life, that really really works. That's true. I don't know if it's a substance control substance or not. I don't care. I'm giving treatments that really work to people and really change the life. Why? Because you're not treating the symptom. You're treating the origin of the addiction. No? Yeah. Because people during the, the, the travel really have a, a, a profound mystic experience. And when you compare data, we see that when they have a mystic experience, if they have a good result, in the life to the addiction is totally uh, parallel. They, they go they go on the same side. If you don't have a mystic addiction, a mystic experience, you're gonna treat not very well the addiction. But when you have a mystic experience, the addiction go go by. So really, we need to see this medicine like a real revolution. We are talking about a new way to treat problems with mental health like addiction. Okay. It's not okay. Let's talk in the symptom and okay. I'm in depression, so I'm, I need to feel better. No, let's talk about the depression, but not talking about the depression to reinforce the problems. Let's talk about the depression to relieve your problem, yeah. so you can don't need to be depressive again. I I feel like it's more powerful because in some of these scenarios, you know, they are guided by a mental health therapist, um, and, you know, licensed health counselors and everything else. But at the end of the day, when you do it. And this is kind of what was the appeal of cannabis to me. It made me very introspective. When you do it with psychedelics, you kind of, it's not like you're going to a traditional therapist and you're telling your story and they're kind of helping you see what you didn't see. And they're telling you what you did wrong. And you have to come to the realization you're telling yourself and who are you going to believe more than yourself? Right? Because there's always that thing with a therapist, like that guy doesn't fucking know me. He doesn't know my story. He can't relate to it. 
specifically with addiction, right? If you look here in the United States, specifically in South Florida, where I'm from, there are people, you know, if you didn't go through, you know, if you, if you're not an addiction, if you haven't had that problem and you open a center, you are looked down upon because people who go through your program are like, I, you don't know what the fuck I'm going through. You never had this struggle. Right. So even though they're giving you the right message and they're telling you what you should and shouldn't do based on their experience with other people, you know, they, they look down upon you at that. And I think by adding the psychedelic element and letting you go on your own journey to figure out and be introspective and figure what you've done wrong is what makes it sticky. Because at the end of the day, my wife would always tell me, you can't get better unless you want to get better. And I think what this does is it rewires their brain to make them realize, no, I don't want to live this life. I don't want to be this way. Look at what I'm doing to my friends, my family, my life. This is not how I set out to be. Um, it amazes me that there is still stigma around this. I, I kind of get the cannabis thing still. I'm in the industry and I know, you know, there are a lot of people that are trying to hold on to the cannabis as an outlaw symbol. And the unfortunate part of that is, yes, that is the origins. And if it wasn't for that, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. And I truly respect that. But at some point, if you want it to be widely available, if you want it to grow, if you want to be able to share your passion with the world, you have to accept everybody else. When it comes to the world of psychedelics and the fact that it's in more of a clinical scenario, if you put a Pfizer or a GSK sign on the outside of that building, the amount of people that would probably get behind it are exponentially higher. And if you put it in a little plastic pill that dissolved in your stomach and the same product still went into your system, they would support it too. The root of pharmaceutical is plant. It just goes through a fucking facility to turn it into a pill. All you guys are doing is taking the raw ingredients, right? So at the end of the day, you know, people that are taking medication through pharmaceutical companies, they're they're eating Doritos and shit. You're just giving them the corn before it gets processed into all of that. So it's very interesting to me. And, and kind of on that natural medicine note, I believe that Latin America and South America, you guys are more in touch with natural products. Here in the United States, we are a manufacturing country. We make shit we make shit that already exists for some reason we you know what harvesting this costs too much money so let's just make it with a bunch of chemicals and it'll be cheaper that's what we do and that's that's our own problem that we have to deal with here but you guys i remember i forget what country it was but it was some country in latin america i remember i had a wendy's burger at the airport and it was one of the best burgers i ever had because it was natural it didn't have all the bullshit it has here in the states so on that note are you seeing psychedelic therapy being more widely accepted because of Latin America's connection with natural things and, and more healthier, pure products? Of course. Uh, in Brazil, we have a long tradition now about ayahuasca, a very long tradition. A lot of people do ayahuasca uh, every month. It's, it's common. It's, it's, you have the religion use, religion use of ayahuasca that can in Brazil by, see, uh, by centuries. So, so, of course, people understand much more quickly what you're talking about when you talk about the treatment with psychedelics. People understand this reset point of psychedelics much more easier in Brazil than in other countries because, of course, one time in your life you have to talk about that. That's, that's impossible to never talk about that. Ayahuasca is everywhere here. So uh, that's, of course, these cultural, um, cultural roots in Brazil are much more strong than in other countries and of course we are much more closer of nature we have a life that's much more integrated with nature and when something comes from the nature of course we accept and even if you know we accept better than the pills so that's changed of course but uh, but more than that i i want to talk just about the the the, the effect the effect is really different but because all medicine is talking about there's no those sick care, no? Oh, you have something with some disorder, let's talk about your sick care. Here I'm talking about health care. I talk to, to really be healthy. And I don't want you, no, I, 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 you know, I'm not talking about your, your sickness. It's true, I'm talking to focus on your healthy. Everybody's healthy if you look close, no? So when people start to, to take uh, psychedelic treatments, they start to bad, have a better relation with their kids with their family, they start to make exercise, they start to be more fit, they start to be, to, I don't know, uh, sleeping better. So everything changed in your life 
because like you say you're not you have to treat your problems you have to really look inside you look inside your problems and you solve your problems by your own that's the the, the the mystical experience that you look at your problems you can look at it you can talk with your problems with no 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 hungry no no you get, can just look at about it and 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 we will be in peace with that. When you, we, we read uh, Omero, the, the Greek one, and the Odyssea, that's the, the, the first book of the, the Occident, Western culture. Uh, in one moment, Ulysses, this guy who is coming back for his house after the Troy war, he stopped in a, in a village. And in one moment, uh, one, one of Helen, it was the, the, the girl, it was the, the woman, it was the, the war of Troy, it was because of Helen. <laughs> They have changed. Ellen gives to him some pill in the wine, and she says something very beautiful. She says is to he can talk about their 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 problems without uh, be uh, hungry, not you know, without uh, crying. So that's that's the opportunity. You can see your problems, you can see your your traumas without crying, and that's help a lot to be a healthy person. And, and really change. It is, it's impressive to see patients coming to, to our, our, our clinics. You know? they, they come like, whoa. And they, when they get, they get out, they're really flying. You know? They're really in a, in a different mood. And this mood is not something that's going to be during two or four days and then you need again. No, this mood during for I don't know, one, two, two years without a new psychedelic you need to use a new psychedelic. So it, that's something very impressive for us. No, it is, and it is interesting to me. And one of the things that really catches my attention with this is, you know, we talk about this specifically in cannabis, just the the prohibition that's been put on it, at least in this country for the last hundred years. But if we look back on the history of the world and we look back on biblical times and everything else, as you just mentioned, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, one of my favorite stories um, Greek mythology. I, I took mytho enough mythology classes in college to actually have a minor in it. I just didn't know what that can do for me professionally. So I never accepted it. But long story short, you know, and, and again, I hear this in just on other podcasts and everything else. I haven't done this research myself, but there is theory that a lot of the speaking with God and a lot of these mythical things within the Bible and all these other religious texts is really experiences with psychedelics and, and cannabinoids and and really it was just these natural things that people were doing and you know they talk about moses and the, the burning bush and that was really either a psychedelic or a cannabis experience that he had and he you think that you're talking to god because back then there was no way of explaining it there was no science behind it where it's well you know you're ingesting dmt and this is how it affects your brain and this is what you're going through so to today's times i think there are people out there that hear you and i talking just now about saying that it allows you to face your problems head on and take that journey and having yourself tell you what's wrong with you they think that you know they probably have this beautiful hollywood image of you going on an actual journey and like having this whole image in your head where it's really just at the end of the day, it makes you introspective and however that approaches you on whatever substance that you're taking. And my point of this is, is we're looking at this as if this is new. And I've even recently said, you know, one of my favorite things about this is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, and expecting a different result, right? Well, then by that definition, we're fucking insane when it comes to treating mental health and when it comes to treating addiction, because we're doing the same thing over and over again with very, very low levels of success. In fact, the people that are succeeding are really the ones that are truly motivated to fix themselves where they're willing to do whatever they can to fix themselves. And that's how they do it. The majority of people are just falling back into the same shit that got them to where they were to begin with. But we look back over time and you have all these great people throughout history, these leaders, which happen to be in the Bible, that happen to be in these historical contexts. And they have, whether it's mythology or just even pure history, they have these experiences with, with psychedelics and cannabis and other natural substances that gave them the vision or gave them the dream or wrote the, helped them write the playbook to be as successful as they are. Even in today's times, we see people that are writing books, people who have massive success like John Lennon and Paul McCartney and Steve Jobs, and they, they come up 
with beautiful art in the form of art or music or even art in business. You know, at the end of the day, you look at Apple as a technology company, it is kind of an art company too with the products they put out. It's an art and technology that these prolific leaders have this experience and all of a sudden the general public, the, the majority of us that are a bunch of fucking morons are saying that that shit's bad. Why? Anybody who's been great probably has some kind of experience with it. So that's why it blows my mind that we have to essentially shout from the hilltops and have these deep educational conversations with people where it's like, no, this stuff has been used forever, forever. Somebody well along the line was pissed off of it. Maybe they didn't want the general public to be as smart as them and they banned it. And now we're just fighting to go back to the way it was before. And that's something that truly blows my mind. And I think that's universal in every country. Yeah, totally. And just like about the, all this uh, religion experience, now people say they will see God, uh, people more close to the psychology side say uh, ego disillusion, you know, uh, ego disillusion, the nirvana, let's see. But it's always the same, you know, you touch a mystic point, then you, try to you start to understand that you are part of the universe. And, that's, and this experience really changed your life. And that experience that have Steve Jobs, that experience that have some of the videos, the most psychedelic videos was George Harrison. You know? <laughs> so not the, even not John Lennon or, or, or Paul McCartney. Uh, but yes, you always have this kind of... Everybody of... always leaves Ringo out. <laughs> Everybody, always. <laughs> well, but we have all those ambassadors of, of this conscience bringing. We have a very good book in English. It's called The Religion with No, with no Name of Brian Murarescu. He's a very easy, he's wrote in English. I think he have a Pulitzer for this book. It's very interesting. He, he tell the history of Eleusis. Eleusis was a temple in Greek, you know, ancient Greek, when uh, Platon, Socrates came one time in a year to have this experience. Uh, the 22 September of the, the year, they come to Eleusis temple to have an experience, this, this mystic experience with a psychedelic. So we will have a lot of, of examples that the, um, the psychedelics have been used years and years and years. But of course, oh, the problem is not psychedelics. The problem is always the prohibition. You know? When yeah. you start to, to look in the 80s about the, the crack problem in the US, crack, uh, US spent $1.5 billion uh, against in the world of drugs. Now, US is spending $40 billion uh, against drugs. And you have a much worse problem with opioids than you have with crack. No? So uh, you still be doing the same with a bad results and you know the result that that's not the way and you're still doing more and more and more. So that's the insane part. No, that's a crazy part. That is not, uh, that is really crazy that we're still running uh, a race that you know that will take you to a better, uh, uh, yeah. a worse place you know? and not stop and say, okay, Let's review that. Let's talk about provision in another part. But I don't know. People have, um, they are scared about, I know, elections. Uh, we have a very conservative person that still have been a, a brain, um, brainwash about with this, all this, this lobby against drugs. Now remember Reagan saying, just say no. Uh, yep. No, not, nothing more stupid than, than say that because uh, the world always have used drugs. And maybe you cannot reach the real happiness without drugs, without a little drugs, some use of drugs, no? Okay. So drugs have been always with us. So let's integrate that into our world. And that's something that we really need to change because this race with the drugs of war is insane and, is, is, and start to be very, very, very uh, expensive and dangerous uh, because drugs, um, uh, the, 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 the money of drugs is taking politics, is taking everything, and and that will send it will be something that we won't control if you don't change the rules. Uh, I, I couldn't possible. I couldn't agree more, and I can talk to you about why things should be different and why they could be the way they are. But let's talk a little specific about what you're doing today. Tell me about ibogaine specifically, because I don't know anything about it. the The world of psychedelics is new to me. Why? You know, why a focus on Ibogaine, you know, um, in your practice? Ibogaine. Ibogaine is a plant of, of uh, came from Gabon, from the African. It's an African uh, tradition of booty. It's a, uh, 
uh, our ancient African tradition. Uh, they use there to the, to when when young people start to have 16 years old, it was the, the moment to, to go to uh, to adultness, to uh, adult life. So they use ibogaine in this moment. But some some hippies uh, in the 17th start to travel to Africa, and with this experience, he start to feel that he will had liberated of heroin. That's why so start to talk about that. Oh, I take ibogaine, and I, I never take again heroin, and so that start to, to really goes on. Uh, we have made a lot of studies about that. We have more than, than 10, 12 papers talking about how ibogaine uh, helps with drug addiction because we really uh, cut off some um, uh, relations in your, in your brain. It's like a reset in your brain that can help you to treat addiction uh, different. It's uh, eight weeks eight week process protocol so you don't take too much time of your life let's say like that it's not that you need to be in a mental health system between I don't know years and years no our protocol take eight weeks and after that that's true we have seven eight percent of the, the the patients that don't use drugs again uh, so it's a very low risk and a very good game if you use ibogaine one time in your life because that really can change your relation with the addiction. And that's just the first, the first part is addiction. But remember that people who take psychedelics not just fix the addiction problem, but fix a lot of other problems in their life because we really reevaluate their lives. So I, I think that is, is give us the opportunity to experience something that really can improve and make you a better guy, a better person, uh, and take out your addiction problem, of course. Is, is this a model you think you can replicate elsewhere in the world? Because, you know, w there is a huge problem. Specifically, I live in one of the biggest centers of addiction in the entire world, definitely in the United States. And I like to see different things. You know, I, I don't know exactly what, what companies are doing here, but 78% is is a lot better than the current recovery rate that we have here in the United States, specifically in South Florida, you know, is the goal for you to, to prove the model there, get the scientific studies and, and scale it out to the rest of the world? We uh, right now we really uh, believe in this plant basis. Uh, what you are offering right now is these eight weeks of protocol, uh, seven weeks can be done by internet, <laughs> can be done by telemedicine. Okay. Oh, wow. So it, Yes, of course. In the preparation and the integration we do with telemedicine. We do even in Brazil. I have something I don't know in other city. They don't travel to have the psychologist pr uh, practice to to prepare the experience. You need you don't just need to travel to the experience. There's a five days travel. Okay, you you I don't know you arrive on Monday with us. Um, in in Tuesday you I prepare you. On Wednesday you get the the experience I game. On, on Thursday, you 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 be just near of us. We're gonna uh, sleep one night in the hospital. The other night, we're gonna be in a hotel just near the hospital because we want to get you very close. And on Friday, you're flying back to your house. Oh wow! So, uh, so uh, is um, of course you want to scale. You want to, but what you really see that right now with our infrastructure, we have two clinics. We're working in two cities. One with uh, very direct flight with US. Uh, we have direct flight to with Toronto, uh, Canada, with Vancouver, but we have direct flight with New York, Miami, Dallas, Los Angeles. Uh, I don't know. So we really can with those those patients can really bring bring to our clinics because we have uh, the the compliance space very well done and have this experience with us. I think that that's the, the best way to scale, to really scale with, because you no, know, when, when those industries come, uh, the cannabis ha happen the same, you know, you have a lot of blah, 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 you know, uh, and you now you have a lot of people that, that were not really doing things very well. So we believe in a serious work. We really work with physicians, with uh, stable products. We're really working on, we're in hospital environments, you know, just to be very protect for any problem that people can have. And, and really want to give an excellence of, uh, of uh, excellence uh, products for patients. So for us, the best way is have this six weeks of preparation 
with you in your house, telemedicine, travel to Brazil. And after that, you have two more weeks of integration of your experience in the US by your telemedicine with someone who speaks in English, a much better English than I do, and can talk with you and really can, um, you can have this experience in a very safe environment and most of them in your house. That because I think it's very important to people who are sickness, who have addiction problem, they stay close to people who love them you know, and not, not isolate them from the people they love. That's beautiful. And I would leave it to our country to outsource our problems for the rest of the world to fix continually. So thank you for that. Um, Marco, where can people find you if they wanted to learn more? You can find in Bienstar is our holding company, but Beneva Clinics, you can look in internet. Beneva Clinics is the, the easiest way to go ahead. There you have a WhatsApp number. You can talk and you talk directly with our assistant who speak English, all of them. So you can be in contact with us with a WhatsApp message. You start to be in contact with us in an English and you're going to have a, a pro English prof um, professional who speak very good English talking with you and helping you with all the, the protocols and, and all the, the things that you need to start to treat. Very cool, man. Marco, thank you so much for joining today. I really enjoyed the conversation. I look forward to doing this again. Thank you, Todd. I know that we can speak for hours and hours because we have so many things in common. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It is hard to keep this to just an hour, my friend. And thank you for joining us. Thank you to everybody at home for watching. Of course, if you missed any part of this conversation, you can always catch it again on youtube.com slash elevate your grind. Um, it'll also be on our LinkedIn page, linkedin.com, I think, slash the cannabis lab. As I mentioned, if you want to check out any of our events, Google Cannabis Lab Eventbrite, they're all going to be listed there. You can get your tickets, get your access. If you want to find out more about Cannabis Lab, check out joincelab.com. It's been another episode of Elevate Your Grind.